What's happening, people? Today's guest is Timothy Owen Desmond, a professor of philosophy. We get into some absolutely insane topics. If you are not scientifically inclined, intellectually inclined, philosophically inclined, I guarantee you that there is something for this. One of the things that we like to do on this podcast are take great concepts and make sure that you can apply them to your life. And that is exactly what we do. Tim's a great speaker. He's a great storyteller. Bear through the first couple minutes where he talks about what he actually does because for most of us, we have no idea all those scientific terms and all that stuff. If you stick through this one, you will get some gold. Enjoy. The way will, John. What's happening, people? Welcome back to the podcast, which has been very regular. So I know all of you are happy since we took a long, long break at the beginning of this year. Today, we've got the special guest, Professor Timothy Desmond. How you doing? What's Good. going on? Just getting ready to talk about some cool ph philosophical topics here. <laughs> yeah. As I said, before we got on, this is uh, some stuff that I have a fascination with. I mean, not a whole lot of people know that. Some people know me from the language channel. Some people know me from uh, football or soccer. And over here, it's a blessing to be able to get into stuff that I do when I'm not on the field or studying. Uh, why don't you give us a background into who you are, what you're about, and uh, we'll go from there. So I am... Timothy Owen Desmond is my name, but I go by my initials. My parents started calling me Todd because my brother Jim and I'm Tim, when they would call one, the other would come running. So they said, we'll call this one Todd. So that's, <laughs> I've always known myself as Todd, but my legal name is Timothy Owen Desmond. I've got a PhD in philosophy and religion with a concentration in philosophy, cosmology, and consciousness from the California Institute of Integral Studies. Before that, I got a, a master's degree in political science from the University of Hawaii with a focus on alternative futures studies. And my focus was how do, what are the implications for political science coming from 20th century physics? So that's special relativity, general wow. relativity, quantum mechanics, and string theory. So I don't know the mathematics behind those theories, but I read the books written by the physicists who discovered the theories or who are at the top of the field, and they write books, I'm sure you've seen them, read a few, that are for the, the educated non-expert. So someone who's willing to think through difficult concepts without all of the mathematical language. So I, I read those kinds of books and then compare them to philosophers from the Western tradition and the Eastern tradition, the Vedanta philosophy of India in particular, and Plato. And a lot of these founders of quantum mechanics especially were big fans of Plato. And that's a, a major theme of my book. So my dissertation is titled Psyche Equals Singularity. And then I wrote it as a book, Psyche and Singularity, Jungian Psychology and Holographic String Theory. And that book also is the basis for a class, an online class that I just released called Immortality and the Unreality of Death, A Hero's Journey Through Philosophy, Psychology, and Physics. And it all comes down to the main point is this equation, psyche equals singularity. So by that, I mean a gravitational singularity, a point of infinite gravity, a point of infinite density that is implied in Einstein's general theory of relativity, even though Einstein himself rejected the idea, thought it was impossible. There, there can be no such thing as infinite anything. Um, so, but the reason that I got interested in it is because I was reading a book about Carl Jung, and I was reading one of the letters Carl Jung wrote to, a, to somebody named J.R. Smithies on February 29, 1952, and he was speculating about the relationship between psychic energy and mass. So he assumed psychic energy or the psyche, it's the Greek word for soul. He assumed it's an in independent existing thing. It's not a byproduct of matter. It's not a some kind of a biochemical after effect. But if it is its own source of energy, then according to Einstein's equation, E equals mc squared, energy equals mass times the speed of light squared, which he learned about from Einstein himself over dinner conversations in Switzerland between 1909 and 1912. If psyche has its own energy, that energy must have mass. Why can't we measure the mass of the psyche, of the soul? 
I know Dan Brown in right. one of his books, he, that was the concept. They tried to weigh the soul when someone died. The little scale went down. <laughs> right. So that was kind of what he was thinking yeah. of. Maybe it's so small we can't measure. We don't have the devices sensitive enough to measure the weight of something that small. But then in this letter that I just mentioned, he speculated maybe we can't measure uh, psychic energy because it's infinitely intense. And he was thinking in the terms infinitely intense, intense. or dense. And that's the same thing intense. because intensity, okay. like an intensity of a wave, as the as it gets more intense, sure. the waves get closer and closer together. That's more that's denser. So energy and mass, the main thing to keep in mind, are equivalent terms. So if energy and mass are equivalent, psychic energy must be measurable like mass. And why can't we measure it? Because it's infinitely intense. So a gravitational singularity is an infinitely intense piece of mass. It's compacted. It's so dense, it's infinitely dense, and it disappears from space. And it disappears from time. Mm -hmm. So he speculated about these things regarding um, special relativity and general relativity. He said, well, if it's infinitely intense, the psychic energy, that would be equivalent to going faster than the speed of light. Things... Time stops at the speed of light. Matter gets contracted to a you know, to a point. It would therefore disappear from space time, and that's why we cannot measure it. And then he ended the letter with this equation: psyche equals highest intensity in the smallest space. So the highest intensity of anything would be infinite, and the smallest space is zero volume. And that's the definition of a gravitational singularity. It's a point of infinite density, a point of infinite intensity. So psyche equals singularity. Right. And so the singularity, obviously, which has also been one of these huge buzzwords that we've gone into, and I know we, we were going to talk about, or we will get to that there. But I want to go back to uh, what we started to talk about a little bit, which was the hero's journey. Because as I, as I mentioned, uh, you know, what we love to do on the podcast is find ways to apply all of this knowledge. And, you know, I mean, there are a lot of guys here that have just listened to that and just gone, well, that's interesting. Right. But, <laughs> right. And sure. so what you kind of explained there with going, actually, could you explain the hero's journey uh, just in, in layman's terms for us? Right. So, yeah, this class, Immortality and the Unreality of Death, a hero's journey through philosophy, psychology, and physics. So a hero's journey, Joseph Campbell is probably the one most famous for promulgating that idea. He was the one who edited the portable Jung. So he was a great student of Carl Jung. Joseph Campbell, he was an American um, cultural historian. And he wrote things like the hero's journey or the masks of God. And so his idea following Carl Jung was that the human mind is organized by these archetypal ideas. And, and this is the same as Plato's theory of the absolute ideas imprinted on the soul. So to make it uh, as simple, I think, as I can to introduce it, I'll just use Plato's terminology because it's the same as the archetypes of the collective unconscious. That's what Carl Jung talked about. And he said himself, along with his partner in, in uh, thought, the founder of quantum mechanics, Wolfgang Pauli, they both said, oh, this idea of archetypes of the collective unconscious is equivalent to Plato's theory of the absolute ideas imprinted on the soul. So according to that theory, everything that you perceive with your five sense organs that you can see, smell, touch, taste, or hear, like this lamp or a cloud or a tree or a human, is an imperfect, temporary, shadowy reflection of an eternal, perfect form or idea of that thing. And all of these par perfect forms exist specifically at the outermost sphere of the universe. And that's very important to keep in mind because 20th century physics developed into holographic string theory, which unites general relativity and quantum mechanics. And it says the past, the present, and the future are interwoven at each point of this encompassing horizon of the cosmos from which they radiate in on these strings of energy to create this holographic illusion of three-dimensional forms. It's exactly what Plato said, that this interior of the universe is a temporary illusion, like a dream projected from the absolute ideas of things out at this outermost horizon of the cosmos. And furthermore, when you die, your soul can travel out to that outermost 
sphere and behold these perfect forms of knowledge, the archetypes of the material forms. And that nourishes the soul. And then when you reincarnate after having seen these absolute ideas, the longer you've contemplated them, the higher your body will be with the standard of height being philosophical knowledge of the relationship of the soul or the psyche to the universe and these absolute ideas. Mm -hmm. If you haven't seen them, then you'll be born as a tyrant or some, you know, something, you know, tyrant is at the bottom of the scale, philosophers up at the right. top, depending on how <laughs> long you perceive these forms, depend, it determines the height on that ladder of uh, reincarnation. Okay. Before you even go there, could I, uh, am I wrong in trying to deduce the idea of this, you know, Plato's theory of forms, right? These eternal, amazingly perfect, uh, you know, abstract and uh, I guess somewhat concrete too at the same time, yeah. uh, ideas that exist outside. Is this at all, and this may be crazy at least to, to suggest, but is this at all linked to what is the new age thought of manifesting in some ways or could it be brought to link? Meaning that if, uh, you know, there's that famous quote from either Michelangelo or whichever one of those guys, which was the... Uh, sculptor, I mean, I think they all were to some degree, right. who said that he's, you know, that the, he brought the statue or he brought the, his art, it was hidden, let's say, inside of the right. the rock or the statue and that he brought it out, right? And, and many, I think, people would feel that when they create, if they're really, if they're naturally creative or artistic or something like that, that their ideas come from somewhere else that it comes from this place outside and that the greatest things that we have here on earth is your ability to take something from the, this theory of forms and, and just, and put it here, right. And manifest it here in some way. And so, uh, my question was, was one, does that make sense? And two, what do they say about actually taking perfection from there? and bringing it here? Did they, did they understand how that was done better or why some artist does it so well and other people do not? Yeah, well, in, in Plato's Republic, which is this most famous dialogue, so Plato was the student and disciple of Socrates. Aristotle was the student, I wouldn't say as much of a disciple of Plato because Aristotle took the philosophy in, in, a, in a different direction, this philosophy of absolute forms. But Socrates, he was the barefoot philosopher who walked around Athens questioning everyone like a gadfly about the soul and the nature of, you know, justice. You said that in college you, you were into Plato, so then you know the character Socrates, which is a big part of Plato's philosophy. But in the Republic, Socrates is imagining how to create an ideally just city-state because they're looking for justice in the individual soul and they think, oh, well, that's hard. It's soul is small. Let's expand it to the sphere of an ideal city. If we can find justice there, we can extrapolate on to where it is in the pattern of the individual soul. And one of the, so that one of the ways they decide they're gonna make an ideally just city is to train the leaders to open the eye of their soul to the idea of the good, which is the source of all the other absolute ideas. And they use the cave allegory to describe that. We live in, it's like a cave of shadows. But at any rate, the curriculum includes mathematical studies of the four ascending dimensions of space and time. You start with individual numbers, which are dimensionless points, the number seven, the number nine, they're all individual ideas. And then you have the first dimension on a number line where you can do math, like add addition and subtraction, multiplication and division. And then you have a two-dimensional plane, and that's where you can do geometry. And then you have a three-dimensional object, and that's where you can do spherical geometry, which Socrates says we haven't really developed yet here, but we should. And then finally, you can study the movement of three-dimensional objects to study time, especially the planets and the vibrations of musical strings. So when you know the mathematics of the movement of the spherical or just three-dimensional objects and, and culminating with astronomy and music, that will turn the eye of the soul, this organ of knowledge, which is equivalent to an eye, inward to the idea of the good, this brilliant source of being. And once you have perceived that, it's blinding and painful at first, and you'll be 
bewildered, but after your eye of your soul is adjusted to the light, then, says Socrates, you'll be able to see and understand and predict the patterns of material forms 10,000 times better than everybody else. So that will give you superpower. Wow. And he called that the philosopher king. This is the archetype of a human being as described in, in Plato's Republic by Socrates. Now, Socrates didn't have all the qualities of the philosopher king. And a lot of people say for Plato, Socrates is the archetype of a human being. He's funny. He's ironic. He's self-deprecating. You never know if he's telling the truth or lying. So how literally did Socrates want us to take the idea of a philosopher king? That's open to debate. But at any rate, it's a it's a good starting point for your question was, how can you apply this knowledge of the absolute ideas to your life? Well, understanding the absolute ideas, the sources of the things that you're experiencing in the three-dimensional world will enable you to manipulate those three-dimensional objects in this material life 10,000 times better than people who haven't seen it. But you'll be just, according to Socrates, so you won't abuse that power, but you could. I see. I find similarities within some of the Eastern traditions uh, as well. I mean, we're talking now about, I mean, obviously you're, you're, you're well aware of what the, the Siddhis uh, are and uh, what happens through these, uh, whether they're meditative practices or, you know, these ritualistic practices that get these guys um, interesting abilities or, you know, the claims at least for right. these interesting the eight, abilities. Eight mystical um, powers. Right, right. And I mean, I, I see similarities in that. What I don't see as much, and I don't know if this was stamped out of Western society, how or why or hidden or moved to the occult practices, but what I don't find as much, I mean, perhaps through maybe, I don't know if the, uh, the Rosicrucianism, which I don't, I haven't studied very well, but I know that they have certain methods and practices for doing certain things that are, you know, related to what we're talking about here. But what I don't find as a whole are what Socrates just described, where's the playbook? Right. In the Eastern tradition, there's so many, I mean, you can get lost in deciding which way to meditate this way. The, the Eastern traditions have laid out just pathways after pathway after pathway to right. get you going down this path. Right. But in the West, I see no clear winner and i also don't see very much acknowledgement uh of this and very much we don't value it as much and so my question is did they have a playbook did socrates did plato have like a do this do that run through this path or do this practice did they have anything oh like yeah that? definitely um <laughs> the entire academic tradition is the playbook that Socrates laid out or that Plato laid out. I was just telling you about the mathematical curriculum. That's a playbook. Mm -hmm. Study linear math, study two-dimensional plane geometry, study spherical geometry, study astronomy and music, study these mathematical forms because those are the lowest level of the eternal world and those mathematical forms are like the eternal shadows of the higher level of forms. So, you know, I think uh, a really good thing to just have in mind as a general piece of education is the cave allegory, Plato's cave allegory that Socrates is explaining. Yeah. Tell it, please. Yeah, so yeah. this is the most famous way that Socrates described his theory of the absolute ideas, or at least that Plato depicted him doing that. So Socrates says, imagine someone at birth taken down into a subterranean cave, an underground cave, and then they're shackled head to foot so they can't move their heads and see the people lined up next to them on either side. All they can do is look at the back of the cave. Now behind them, above the entrance to the cave, is a brilliant fire. And between the fire and the prisoners is a barrier that goes up halfway to the height of the cave. And behind that barrier, guards walk. And they hold up on sticks silhouettes, puppets, which are facsimiles of the natural objects outside, like a rabbit or a tree. And they walk back and forth behind this barrier. So their shadow is not cast on the wall in the back of the cave, but the shadows of the puppets are. And the shadows of the prisoners are also cast on the back of the cave. So all they can see is their own shadows, their neighbor's shadows, and the shadows of the puppets. They can hear uh, people walking behind them, and they hear it bounce off the wall so they can hear the echoes of things behind them, and they can see the shadows of things behind them, but they think everything in reality is just the shadows and the sounds that they hear echoing off that. So then somebody comes down from, oh yeah, and they pride themselves on predicting which shadow will come in which sequence. 
And that is whoever can do that the best is the most brilliant and respected by all the other prisoners. And that was probably an allusion to people studying astronomy at the time. So someone comes out from the upper world down into the cave, breaks the shackles, turns the person around and says, behold, this is what you think. You're, these are the shadows that you're looking at. These are the source of the shadows. But it, the fire is so bright, it blinds the prisoner's eyes. And now he can't see anything. And he thinks this person has driven him insane. And then the person from outside drags him up the rough and steep ascent out to the outer world. And now the sunlight really blinds his eyes and it's horribly painful. And he thinks he's totally gone insane. But then gradually at night, he can look around and see things. And in daytime, he can look in puddles of water and see reflections of things, including the sun. And eventually he can take a glimpse at the sun itself. And then he realizes, ah, this is the source of reality. In Socrates' worldview, the sun is the source of the earth and everything else. And everything down in that abominable cave, oh, what a nightmare that was. And then the person who released him said, okay, congratulations. Isn't this wonderful? Isn't this freedom? So now go back in the cave and return the favor. So he goes back down into the cave and now his eyes have to readjust to the darkness and the people who can see the shadows think he's a fool because he can't even see the shadows anymore. But when he reacclimates to the darkness, then he can predict the shadows 10,000 times better than everyone else because he just looks behind him and he sees the guards lining up or queuing up. And then he says, okay, here's what's going to happen. Rabbit, tree, tree, rabbit, uh, bush. And then lo and behold, boom. And everyone's amazed. But not everybody's amazed at first because he can't see those shadows and they think, oh, this person's trying to blind me and make me insane. I'd rather kill this person than allow them to turn me into something as foolish as he is. And um, if they could get their hands on him, they would kill him. That's so that, that's the cave allegory, because Socrates was ultimately executed by the people of Athens, whom he was trying to get out of the cave of shadows. So then Socrates says, OK, here's the allegory. As the shadows on the wall of the cave are, are there, they are what the three dimensional objects that we see are. The visible sun, it's like the three dimensional world we live in is a cave. The sun is the light in the is the fire in the cave and the three dimensional objects, including our own bodies, are the shadows on the wall of the cave. And if you study math in particular, so there's the playbook, but there's another side to it also, then you can rotate the eye of the soul inward and perceive the absolute ideas of which these three-dimensional objects are just shadows. And the idea of the good is the spiritual sun, and it's the source of all of the other absolute ideas like tree and rabbit and justice and beauty. They're all condensed into one infinitely brilliant absolute idea of the good, to see which makes you a just person in public and private life. And so studying math very carefully will automatically open the eye of your soul to the idea of the good. And I think this is happening in Western civilization through the advancements of physics in the 20th century, culminating with holographic string theory, which was presented by an atheist, Leonard Susskind. So there's the irony. So this mathematical study, that's one side, but the other side is just attentive respect to the enlightened person like Socrates. Um, people in some of the dialogues said, Socrates, even when I'm just near you, I feel more enlightened. So in addition to the mathematical study, there's also just the studying the archetypal human beings, modeling yourself on somebody who's enlightened like Socrates was. And this idea of love is also important for Socrates. The idea of the good is also the source of beauty and the source of love. And you should, in the symposium, a famous dialogue, Socrates speaks to the priestess Diotima, and she explains how to climb the ladder of love. You see individual beautiful people. Then you realize, oh, there's a lot of beautiful people. What is it about each individual beautiful person that makes me qualify that person as beautiful? And then you work your way up the ladder till you get to the absolute idea of beauty itself. And that, when you open your idea to that, that's the God. So just appreciating beauty and loving people properly and acting justly, in addition to this mathematical study, will help your soul escape the cycle of reincarnation. Right. And I find that really, really fascinating. And I can tell... There's this level of it's it's a level of clarity, and I find that dichotomy between the the, the Western approach and the Eastern approach so fascinating. And it's uh, 
I, I find also it to be kind of strange in our world now. We have a, and I'm when I say we, I'm thinking of also the masses in a sense, and maybe it's not the best uh, representation, but in some sense it is. We have an obsession with science and trusting science uh, as a collective group, uh, which is good, right? Rather than trusting, I don't know, just some guy down by, by the bridge, uh, <laughs> right? right. <laughs> if we have to have a couple choices. I have, I have images but, of the seedy, the seedy bridge and the seedy river somewhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, and, and like, uh, but what I've just taken from you is that one of the most important things that they saw was once you have taken that, that learning and once you've gained those powers, let's say, or that, that ability to turn it inward and turn it inward on your own consciousness and on yourself opens up this whole true understanding, not just on the nature of reality, but also on yourself. And that's what I don't see from the masses obsession with science. I see more of a push to externalize my decision-making and my intelligence and everything to trust this because that, and you know, yeah, we've had some kickback over uh, some certain things and, and stuff like that. And a lot of people are, you know, pushing against, let's say, just mainstream ideas. But still, even that isn't enough, right? Because I think from what I've read, at least in the guys that I've just finished uh, Seneca on the shortness of life, I'm in the middle of, um, or I'm at the beginning stages of uh, Marcus Aurelius's meditations uh, as well. And one of the things that comes out of reading those is this desire and just like Socrates, you know, and, and, and Plato have put to make those tools your own, to make them for you to get that for you, you, you yourself, you, the individual take these, you have these within you and you can use them. And, uh, and so before we get off Socrates, just, I I'm curious, the Socratic method was mentioned in one of the other books that I, that I read. I can't remember the, the author's name, but, uh, I believe it was how to think like a Roman emperor. Uh, I think was, this is about stoicism. Right, right. I'm not sure if you've heard of it. Yeah, uh, I don't but, know about that book, um, but I know that the Stoic tradition okay. was based on Socratic dialectic. That's where I wanted to go. It was uh, I just wanted to get, if you could, an understanding of the Socratic method because I know that it's there's large and big talks about how useful it is, not just as a method to teach and to learn, which a lot of books, you know, some of the books I've read have applied the Socratic method to convey their stories but also just on yourself. So I'm not sure if you know a whole lot about that or if you could explain, you know, what it is and how it could be useful, but that'd be interesting. Yeah, well, in The Republic, after um, describing the ascending dimensions of space and time and studying the math behind it, Socrates mentions understanding how all of those dimensions are interrelated with each other, which is difficult because the units of measurement for one dimension can't be added or subtracted with units of measurement from another, but at any rate, he mentions dialectic. The dialectical method, which is just simply what Socrates did all day, questions and answers with other people. Uh, what is wisdom? Oh, wisdom is knowing how to help your friends and harm your enemies. Okay, let's analyze that. And then here's a contradiction. Oh, well, here's my answer. And the back and forth, the assumption is that the soul contains these absolute ideas, that no matter how educated you are, the mere fact that you are a living being means you are a soul, and every soul is pre-programmed with these eternal absolute forms of knowledge. And through the process of questioning and answering, any two rational human beings, even a child who's reached the age of reason, can zero in on the answers. That we're not bereft of the ability to gain knowledge. It's imprinted in our souls. Now, it helps a lot if you've got the advantage of historical tradition from people who have taken the zigzagging conversations as far as they can go repeatedly and can boil down the conclusions that they've come to. But given an infinite amount of time, any two numbskulls could hammer it out. <laughs> and according to the dialectical method, if they could keep track, then they would eventually come to the truth because it is inscribed in each of our souls. So that's the dialectical method. And that's why Plato presents his dialogues in a dialogue form. It's, they aren't essays. They are Socrates says, you know, Diotima says, or Socrates says, Glaucon says, then this other person says, and back and forth, back and forth. That's the simple, the, the complex word dialectic is just conversation, but using logic and reason to try to zero in on some answers. 
for your students, do you ever give them ways to improve their, I mean, I know you've just gone through the playbook of that, but like, how would, how would one person, like if somebody who's listening to this and they're, they're, they're looped in right now and they're probably pretty fascinated, you're right. Uh, do you give them ways to improve their analytical, rational thinking mind and method? Like, have you ever considered what one person should do if they're like, all right, that sounds like it would be helpful. What do I do? Yeah, well, there's a real simple method. Read, <laughs> read the philosophy. Read Plato's. <laughs> read Plato's. It's too Plato. hard for people. They have TikTok. <laughs> they have TikTok. They can't do that. They can't. You're asking too much. Well, I, uh, I'm but not, yeah, go ahead. Or, that's yeah. asking too much from a lot of my students too. I teach at the College of Southern Maryland intro level philosophy, ethics, and religion classes. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing how much benefit you can get from actually reading the assignments. Um, and then writing essays on them. That's that's the tried and, and true academic method. The academic process is the Western yoga. I was just talking to some people the other day walking down the street and the one guy said, oh yeah, my wife's at a retreat, a yoga retreat, meditation retreat. And he's like, yeah, I tried it, but I just can't just sit there and just meditate on like one point or whatever it is. And, and then I said, yeah, well, reading. Reading is meditation. Reading is yoga, especially if it's a, something like Plato's dialogues or you're studying, you know, what the expert physicists are saying to try to explain it to the non-expert. You're shaping your mind. This is a topic that I discuss in the class Immortality and the Unreality of Death, the Hero's Journey one. Gyana yoga in the Eastern tradition is... The form of most people think of yoga as you bend your body, you do the lotus position, you do the downward dog, all these different geometrical manipulations of your body. Well, there's another form of yoga called jnana yoga, meaning the, the yoga of knowledge. And it's bending your subtle material, mental body, into different shapes, into conceptual shapes. And that's also painful, as any student of philosophy will tell you, it hurts. It's like, what did Kant say? That space and time can't be empirically observed. They're the lenses of cognitive. It hurts. But if you can bend your mind repeatedly into these particular, very definite conceptual shapes and hold them there, then you get the same kind of release of these, you know, cities like you, like you mentioned earlier. Better, more clear thinking, at the very least. A stronger mental body. So a lot of people are interested in keeping their physical bodies fit, which is a good idea, but it's even more important to keep your subtle material body fit. And that's, so for Plato and the Vedanta philosophers, there's a gross physical body, gross just meaning tangible, you can see it, smell it, touch it, touch it taste it, and hear it. And then there's another material, not spiritual body, but a material subtle body, the mental body, which carries the soul from one gross physical body to the next through the process of reincarnation. Plato said that and the Vedanta philosophers like Krishna and the Bhagavad Gita. So that subtle body needs exercise also. It needs to be like when you do stretches Stretched for your physical body. And, yeah. yeah. So, so studying, studying philosophy, studying physics, things like that are how you exercise your mental body. And just us talking right here. It's like working out. You know, right. For sure. And we, we have a, we have a hard time and, and I'm half joking about TikTok, and I'm also not right. Uh, because that does appear to be a, a massive issue, uh, you know, and that I've witnessed in, in my life. And, and I'm sure you have as well, especially as a teacher. I don't, I don't know what it looked like. I don't know how long you've been teaching, how ten, long you've been teaching 10 years, a little more. 10 years. Yeah. Okay. That's enough to see already. Uh, I'm, I'm sure from your first students back then to now, uh, you know, a drastic difference, but you mentioned reading and you mentioned books and I'm, I'm a huge reader. I love to read. Um, and I noticed, you know, when I don't have the time obviously to flex and stretch what would be, let's call it, you know, that mental, you know, body as you were describing it, whether that's through language or good books or that's, you know, some of the stuff I've, I've mentioned, uh, I feel it. You feel it. You can't quite feel it in the same way that you feel a stiff muscle when you've been sitting for too long, but you can definitely feel it and you can notice it. Uh, I see it when I go to, especially because I have such a linguistic background, when I go to speak, how articulate I can be when I've read consistently a bunch of tough books and focused on them and how I'm able to access knowledge 
uh, access my ability to, to speak, how eloquent I am. That all changes, you know, when I read and it drops off a cliff right. when you just ignore it completely and act as if it's not there. So sure. what books and what things, uh, if you could, I mean, I know it's impossible. And I know there are a million books, but uh, maybe just from the, the beginner side, if, if you had to go tell someone, go get these five books on Amazon, go lock yourself in the in Plato's cave and go, right. go read, you know, what would you what would you choose? Oh, well, my book, <laughs> Psyche and, Singul yeah. okay. and yes. Singularity. Because, yeah. because it's providing a framework that's the cutting edge of where physics has gone today. And that sounds intimidating and, and uh, overly complicated, but the farther physics has gone, I believe, the easier it is to understand. When you see the parallels with the philosophers, and this will lead me to some other books to recommend, but Carl Jung and Wolfgang Pauli, who co-created quantum mechanics with Heisenberg and Niels Bohr, the Copenhagen interpretation in 1927. So Pauli was right there in this, in this group of three men who came up with that interpretation. They had a theory that the laws of physics and the laws of psychology should mirror each other because mind and matter both emerge from the same archetypal source. And the ultimate archetype from which all other archetypes emerge, they called the self. They also called it the God archetype, the unus mundus, and the one. And that was based on the Neoplatonists, which is what the Roman emperors were studying. Um, so a mirror symmetry parallels between psychology, the laws of the mind, and physics, the laws of matter. Plato said the same thing, looking at the puddles, reflections of objects in the puddles of water, was a metaphor for looking for the mathematical reflections of these eternal forms. So at any rate, physics has developed through the 20th century from special relativity in 1905, general relativity in 1915, quantum mechanics in 1927, and then in the early 1990s, holographic string theory, which united general relativity, Einstein's theory of gravity, with quantum mechanics, which is all of that particle wave paradox stuff. Quantum mechanics and general relativity work perfectly in their respective domains, but you can't use the one to investigate objects in the domain of the other. The singularity of a black hole is simultaneously infinitely heavy, requiring general relativity, the theory of gravity, and infinitely small, requiring quantum mechanics. They have to work together there. And also, singularity is the source of the universe at the Big Bang. So they have... They had to be somehow made to work together if we're going to understand the cosmos. And that's where they came up with string theory. But the biggest point that I discuss in my book is that according to holographic string theory, which is based on both of those other theories, general relativity and quantum mechanics, it still believes in the Big Bang, but it believes in a multiverse of universes. But the most important point is that the past, the present, and the future are interwoven in each bit of this encompassing horizon of the cosmos where space-time seems to be expanding away from us at the speed of light. And that, that information radiates back in on these fundamental strings of energy to create the holograms. Our bodies are like holograms. And the holographic film is the cosmic horizon. I, that is what I equate with the collective unconscious mind that Carl Jung talks about. And I describe the whole history of Western philosophy from Plato through the Middle Ages with people like St. Augustine and Dante into the Copernican Revolution and then through the empiricists like David Hume, through Kant, up to Hegel. It brought us full circle back to Plato and this whole idea of the absolute ideas out at the horizon of the cosmos and that our three-dimensional bodies and the forms around us are like temporary shadows of those absolute forms. That's the ultimate knowledge to be had, according to Socrates. And the Vedanta philosophers say the same thing, like in the Katha Upanishad. It's a near-death experience of a Brahmin boy named Nachiketas. His father curses him to death accidentally when he was angry at, at a fire sacrifice. And he ends up talking to Yamaraj, the king of death. And he says, I, I want to know, you know, what happens after death? It's just a weird question because he's talking <laughs> to the king of death. But at any rate, the ultimate conclusion is that the soul is like the metaphors uses of a chariot. Your senses are the horses. If you can guide your soul up to this outermost 
horizon of the cosmos, the Akasha. That is where Vishnu resides, God, the Supreme Soul. The past, the present, and the future are interwoven in the Akasha, according to the Brihada Ranyaka Upanishad. It's another famous Upanishad. So this idea of our the interior volume of the universe being a temporary illusion projected from the spherical surface area, that's ancient knowledge from Plato and the Vedanta, which are the pillars of Western and Eastern philosophy. Despite themselves, the physicists have returned us there, not, not aware, at least Leonard Susskind, Stanford string theorist, who along with Gerard Tehuf, the Nobel Prize winning physicist, they together developed holographic string theory. I don't know about Tehuf's philosophical perspectives, but Susskind describes his in books like The Black Hole War and the Cosmic, not the Cosmic Code, the Cosmic Landscape. So he, he, he presents an atheistic argument, though he hems and haws about it, saying he's an agnostic. But at any rate, he presents this theory as proof against the idea of intelligent design and an ensouled universe. The irony being that he has brought it more than anyone full circle back to Plato's original goal of academia. And although Plato doesn't talk about a multiverse, the Vedanta philosophers do. So they have the idea of the souls in the center of the sphere the singularity, which exists at each point of the outermost sphere. And furthermore, a multiverse of universes is, is discussed in the, by the Vedanta philosophers. So at this point of history, Western physics has brought us back to the original understanding of Plato and the Vedanta philosophers. So that was the first book, my book, and I've got a few others. <laughs> Here, I'll mention yeah, just yeah, one more. Go ahead, name them. I'll just, for a practical All person right. who wants to get going, The Passion of the Western Mind by Richard Tarnas. Okay. He's a Harvard-educated philosopher. Okay. I studied with him out at the California Institute of Integral Studies. That's a classic. It's a summary of Western philosophy. Very well written. Okay. And that would be a good introduction. And then based on that, I think you could pick out which of the great classics you would want to read, at least from the Western tradition. I see. I see. That's that's not a bad way of approaching it. Um, I want to touch a little bit on the multiverses in time that you just mentioned, because one of the fascinating things while studying this, while being a meditator myself, you have some interesting experiences with time. Uh, and, you know, uh, and so you start to lose this uh, concept of time as this linear thing with which you just you start here. The past is was then and then the present and and then you have the future, of course, and and obviously you inevitably run up, run upon the concept of uh, the eternal now um, if you start to study these things and what that means to you and, and how you can use that. That's one of the, the, the it's also been slightly a, a massive buzzword for um, meditation and awareness and mindfulness, right? Uh, people that call to be here now, especially with all the distractions we have in our world. But what have you seen or how can you, uh, how do you relate to what they found on time and how should someone, you know, just a person who is hearing this stuff for the first time, how did they discover or not, sorry, not discover, how did they describe time? You know, how did these, these greats and what have you found yourself uh, and how did they, that change their everyday life? You know, what did that make them do this and understand where they were in the world? Right. Well, time, uh, James Clerk Maxwell, 1865, came up with the realization that electricity and magnetism are actually one force, the electromagnetic force. And he came up with four mathematical equations to describe it. And whoever can understand those mathematical equations will tell you that it implies that, that light, which is the electromagnetic force, always travels at the exact same speed. You will always measure it and traveling at the same speed. And uh, Brian Greene, the Columbia University string theorist, always on TV, he's, he's a great educator. He said, it's like telling somebody there's a party 22 miles north without telling you 22 miles north of what? No matter where you go, the party's always 22 miles north of you. That is what the implications of Maxwell's theories were. So Einstein said, okay, Light must always be measured at traveling at the exact same speed. And a Frenchman named Foucault had discovered that speed in the 1860s, just before Maxwell. 
and he was within four kilometers per second of what we've just defined it as now. So it was accurate enough for Maxwell to use in his equations. It's 186,000 miles per second squared. I don't know how many kilometers per second that is. Um, so Einstein said, all right, if light is always measured at the same speed, and if speed or velocity equals distance traveled divided by the time spent traveling, like miles per hour on the speedometer or kilometers per hour, that's your velocity. Well, if V, velocity, must always be constant, then distance and time or space and time must be bendable to keep the speed of, of light constant. So if you're traveling with two cars, one's going 50 miles per hour and the other one's going 100 miles per hour and you shoot a radar gun from the 50 mile per hour car at the 100 mile per hour car, your radar gun will say it's only going 50 miles per hour because relative to you, it is. But if you're in a car going half the speed of light and a light beam is shooting next to you and you shoot the appropriate detector at the light beam, it won't be going half the speed of light. It will be still measured as going the exact same 186,000 miles per second squared. How is that so, Einstein said? Because the rulers that you use or the wavelengths of your radar gun that you use will contract in the direction of travel, and the faster they go, the more they'll contract. So if it takes three yards or three you know, meter yard sticks, meter sticks to get out there at a certain amount of time, those meter sticks will be shrinking. So it'll take more of them to add up to reach there so that it will be shrinking and your clock will be slowing down the faster you go. That's called time dilation. The faster a clock moves, the slower it, the hands on the clock will move. So the faster you're going, you would think, oh, I'm going half the speed of light. Now I'll measure that light beam is going half the speed of light. No, your clock has slowed down and your ruler has shrunk in the direction of travel in just the right proportion that they'll still add up to exactly you will measure that light beam is traveling at the absolute speed of light. So the implication of that is that the past, the present, and the future all coexist. <laughs> um, so the, the famous example is the train on the platform. You're on, a, you're on a platform waiting for a train. The train shoots on by. It's not stopping. As, you're, as the midpoint of the train reaches you and you're at the midpoint of the platform, you see lightning strike both ends of the train simultaneously or both ends of the track. But from people on the train who are going hypothetically half the speed of light or something like that, they'll see the lightning strike the front first, and then they'll see the lightning in the back because it has to travel to catch up to them. So two events that are simultaneous from your perspective, from the perspective of the people on the train, the front strike hit first and the back strike hit after. So the, con the definitions of now are different. And that's called the relativity of simultaneity. And when you look at all the implications, Brian Greene said that Einstein realized what, what I consider now could be your past or could be your future, depending on which direction you're traveling and how fast. But if your now is every bit as real as my now, then the implication is the past must be real, the future must be real, because they could be your now. And with that, Einstein realized time is only an illusion, however persistent, which is a, what he wrote in a letter to a widow of a, a friend of his. In other words, every moment is eternal. That's the eternal now. And that's implied by the mathematics right. of special relativity, which has not been rejected by any advancement in physics since then. So at the very least, I would tell people, physics will tell you time, every moment is eternal. That's a huge philosophical piece of evidence to have in your, in your quill. It was something that Socrates said, but okay, what's the evidence? Well, Socrates said, study the mathematics of the movements of the planets and the, and the vibrating strings and you'll figure it out. And lo and behold, that's exactly what happened. The past, the present, and the future. That is, yeah. Yeah, and then, right. and then it evolved into holographic string theory, which says the past, present, and future are specifically uh -huh. stored at each point of the encompassing sphere of the universe, which is what people who have near-death experiences say that they experience when they get out there. And that's fundamental right. to Plato and the Vedanta philosophy, near-death experiences of this cosmic horizon. Could you, could you touch more on the Vedanta uh, principles? In um, I'm sure, most likely, not a lot of people know some of the core theories and concepts 
uh, that are held within that? What have you learned studying that? Well, I think a good way to start is the Atman Brahman paradox, which Erwin Schrödinger, who discovered the Schrödinger wave function, you know, Schrödinger's cat, Schrödinger, Schrödinger, I've heard it pronounced different ways. Uh, so in quantum mechanics, they did the two-slit experiment. They wanted to know, are quantum particles like electrons and photons? Are they particles or are they waves? So I'm going to explain the Atman is the particle side of the soul, the individual conscious personal soul. And Brahman is the impersonal wave of probability side of the soul. This is something Schrodinger pointed out. So they had this two-slit experiment. We'll shoot electrons through these two slits on a, on a wall placed very close to each other, vertical slits parallel to each other. And if there are particles, they'll line up directly behind the slits on the detector screen, like two straight narrow bands, like machine gun bullets would. If there are waves, the wave will hit both slits at once, radiate two new waves from each slit, and as they radiate outward, they'll ripple into each other and create an interference pattern. The peaks will amplify, the peaks and valleys will negate. There'll be a series of bands of light and dark bands along the detect the entire width of the detector screen, not just lined up in two narrow bands. So they shot these electrons, and the detector the screen always detected each electron hit as an individual particle, but sometimes they're way off to the left, sometimes to the right, sometimes up, sometimes down. After about an hour, though, those individual hits accumulated to the same exact interference pattern that a wave would have made had it gone through all at once. What, you know, what the hell is that? Then they put an electron microscope at the two slits to see which one it actually went through. And when they did that, they lined up directly behind the two slits. When they were observing which slit they went through, they went through as particles like little bullets. When they weren't observing which slit the electrons went through, they went through as waves. But then when they were detected by the detector screen, they collapsed into an individual particle. But when you add up those trajectories, you can infer that they went through as waves. But a liquid wave doesn't turn into a particle when you observe it. So what kind of waves are these? And this is where they came up with quantum mechanics, waves of probability. Really, it's called a wave function. That's described by Heisenberg and Schrodinger. And when you multiply that wave function by itself, when you square it, that gives you a wave of probability for where a particle might appear were you to observe it, most likely at the peak. So those waves of probability, what is that? That's the whole, it's called quantum weirdness. And everyone was astonished and they still are. They're like, that's very, very weird. But that is the reflection in the material world of the nature of the soul, according to the Vedanta philosophers, Atman and Brahman. You're an individual particular, individual soul, a personal Atman. But at the same time, we're all merged as one in this impersonal ocean of potential being, Brahman. And that's the basics of Vedanta philosophy. And then there's different schools of Vedanta philosophy uh, and the impersonalistic schools based on Shankara, it was this seventh or eighth century common era Brahman. He interprets Atman as an illusion and that you should dissolve the Atman like a salt a doll put back in the ocean, back into Brahman. But then in the Middle Ages, the Vaishnava reformers said, no, Atman's true also. And it, it culminated with Chaitanya in the 16th century in Bengal, then known as Gauda. It's called Gaudiya Vaishnava. School of Vedanta. He says, Achintya Beda Beda Tattva. The individual soul is inconceivably simultaneously an individual personal particle and an impersonal wave in the ocean of Brahman. So we are Atman and we are Brahman. Those are mutually exclusive but complementary perspectives of the this, this soul. And it's reflected in quantum mechanics. Uh -huh. I've seen that. Yeah. Same metaphor in a sense with uh, us being say a tree and also branches of the tree or this point of the tree and that we are all contained within that that one or the sea right and the ripple effect out of where there's little individual spots and it's such an easy thing to to grasp when it's put like that and then you hear these greater philosophical um truths and, and teachings about we are all individual, right? Yet we are all one. And it's really hard for people to see that because there is this disconnect. We, we don't feel necessarily, I mean, there are all, plenty of anecdotal things, whether they're, they're twins or just people feeling and knowing what's happening with another person, whether it's a loved one or somebody that they hate or just when emotions evolved. 
But for the average person, I don't think that the, the idea flies over their head necessarily, but I feel that they don't have personal experience with that. Uh, and if you haven't had, whether it's a mystical experience or, or studied in depth uh, the subject, it's hard to conceptualize truly what someone means when you are an individual or some, some will go and say, you, are, you yourself are a god. Uh, we are all individual gods and we are also the one god in the all collective. And it's like, uh, I don't know what to do for that person in, other than because experience is the only thing, obviously, concentration, awareness, focus, uh, and experience are the things that I would say have had the biggest effect on changing my viewpoint on the nature of reality. Um, and I grew up in a very classical setting, it wasn't too strict. There was no push of religion. There was no nothing. It was, you know, I was taught to question everything and to seek knowledge, but nothing changes you like experience. Um, and so I don't know how many of those guys had any mystical experiences or anything. And I know it's more prevalent in, in the Vedanta uh, setup than it is in the West. But my question was going to be, how come and you're aware of Gnosticism? This is I'm going on a far tangent, yeah, but gnosis, you're aware of what it is. Gnosis means knowledge. Right. Yeah. Yes. Right. Greek, yeah. correct? Yeah. Gnosis yeah. coming from yes. Okay. And that is a, a, a system, and they weren't necessarily just a sect. It was a bunch of them, right? If I'm to remember this right, from the Essenes and and different different people. Why why do you feel that in the East it's so prevalent for these things to be out there? I just I, I watch another Indian podcast. They're openly talking about ideas from, uh, I can't remember if it was the Bhagavad Gita, but ghosts, this, that, the other. Why, why such disparity, if you could speculate? Uh, I would speculate that the reason that they're more comfortable talking about those kinds of things is because their tradition is more ancient and has been upheld continuously. Mm -hmm. For thousands of years, there's a lot of speculation that Plato was influenced by the Vedanta philosophers. Their, their philosophies are practically identical. And even the metaphor, for example, of the soul as a chariot driving out to the horizon of the cosmos. Plato does, uses that same metaphor in the Phaedrus or the Phaedrus of dialogue where he's discussing what happens to the soul after death. That, that, uh, Krishna uses in the Bhagavad Gita and that is described in the Katha Upanishad. So if we're getting through Plato, a summary of the Vedanta philosophy, which again, people like Ralph Waldo Emerson and Friedrich Nietzsche and Arthur Schopenhauer all speculated to be the case. Well, and if that's, we've seen how successful Plato's been, that's academia. Even though most academics today would, would, uh, reject Plato's fundamental theories, ironically, again, at least the physicists have come full circle back. And a lot of physicists like Heisenberg and, and Pauli, they knew that Plato had already kind of laid out the blueprint for them. But others like Susskind and, um, you know, I, I'm just a lot of like Stephen Hawking, they're atheists. So at any rate, I would say that in India, that tradition, the original form of it, has been extant and discussed generation after generation continuously for thousands of years. So it's part of their upbringing. It seems normal for them. For us, we call it new age. <laughs> but that's really the oldest age yeah. knowledge that's just kind of coming back in the West since the 1960s, especially uh, with all the fascination with, with also with drugs. I mean, as you were mentioning, there's no, there's no substitute for experience. And most people can't focus and pray so intensely that they have a mystical experience. But then we saw in the 1960s, people had psychedelic drugs. And then boom, instant mystic experience. And, uh, yeah. and I think that was important for the history of the world, especially in the West, because it opened up a lot of people's minds and it gave them direct experiences of the relativity of space and time. I mean, space and time. I have taken psychedelic drugs myself, and uh, that's a very powerful experience. And if there's one thing it teaches you, that it teaches you space and time are malleable. <laughs> that 
the everyday experience of space and time start to melt down and bend and twist. And just that experience alone gives credence in your mind to things like special relativity and to these claims that other people talk about, near-death experiences and things like that. Um, another uh, everyday experience that a lot of people have is synchronicity, meaningful coincidences. I think everybody's had that. Everyone's had deja vu, and most people have had a strange coincidence that seems meaningful. Each one of those implies a union of mind and matter, because what are the odds that all of the history of atomic interactions would culminate at this particular point in this basic time frame to symbolically match the, some meaningful pattern in my mind? And sometimes they're so profound you know, that they change whole lives. Like St. Augustine in the Garden of Milan, he heard some child say, tole lege, tole lege, take and read, take and read. He was having an existential breakdown because he couldn't overcome his lust to become a priest. He opened up the book of scriptures. It was St. Paul, and it said something like, you know, care not for the needs of the body, but just surrender yourself to me. And he said, it seemed to me that it was God speaking through the child to make me read that particular verse, which I randomly opened to, and all the doubts and uncertainties vanished, and I was flooded with certainty and conviction. So every day people can have these synchronicities. I would say pay attention to them. And how is this possible? Is it just me seeing a pattern that's not really there? I would say no. The pattern is there. And if you follow them and pay attention to them, Bob Dylan sang the song, It's All Over Now, Baby Blue. And one of the lyrics is, gather what you can from, ex from coincidence. You know, uh, uh. So there's, you know, even if you don't take psychedelic drugs yeah. or you haven't had a near-death experience or you don't do yoga and meditation for hours a day, you do experience synchronicities or meaningful coincidences. And that alone, should it's your little window to this ground being. To that world. Yeah. I, that's such an important, such an important point. I've had, yeah, plenty of synchronicities. And funny enough, we just had on last week Dr. Andrew Gallimore, who studies DMT. Oh yeah, I, read, um, I, I listened to some of that. Working on, okay, yeah, and you know, he, it's fascinating. Obviously, what that, what they will be able to do, especially if they can prolong that experience. But uh, last year we had on Dr. Dean Radin, who explained some of the very, very, very interesting synchronicities, along with some of the the, the new ideas behind the science uh, of some of the stuff that we're talking about, synchronicities and consciousness. And uh, it's such a good way of, of going about it. And that seems to be the challenge of the current day because the current zeitgeist has materialistic, uh, the materialist worldview up in its face, you know, propagated as the standard way of thinking. Anything outside of that, you know, has to, you know, be put through a certain amount of scrutiny, which is fine, but it, some, it seems sometimes that it's, not really put through scrutiny, but it's dismissed, uh, at least especially by the masses and even sometimes by the guys who are supposed to be <laughs> looking into this specifically. And uh, before I, I go to that last, last thing, you mentioned Ralph Waldo Emerson, who I, I found to be uh, a really interesting, and I can't remember the name of the book or a long essay. You wrote a long essay that's, that's fairly well known that I put on my list uh, to, to read. And you just talked about the new thought um, method. How much of what they have said mirrors what, uh, say, Plato and some of the Vedantic principles, oh. you know, have gone. Is it basically also the same again? Yes. Or <laughs> In a nutshell, yes. Emerson okay. realized, well, he wrote an essay called Plato, semicolon, or, comma, the philosopher. So he was saying Plato is the philosopher. Everyone else is a footnote to Plato. That was uh, Alfred North Whitehead, American mathematician and philosopher. Everything is a footnote to Plato. All right, well, in that same essay, Emerson said, yeah, and Plato learned from the Vedanta philosophers, and he quotes a lot from Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad means great person or God, and Gita means song, so the song of God, the Bhagavad Gita. What Krishna describes to Arjuna on the battlefield, Arjuna is reluctant to fight because it's a civil war and there's family on both sides. He says, Krishna is driving the chariot. Remember the analogy of the chariot taking you out to the horizon of the cosmos? Well, this is related to that. Arjuna tells Krishna, who's driving the chariot, take me to, in between these two battles. Let me see who's here to fight. And then he loses his heart to kill, even though he's not afraid to die or kill, but he's afraid to kill his loved ones, his family. 
He drops his bow, he says, I shall not fight. And then Krishna speaks the Bhagavad Gita to convince him why he should fight. No souls will ever die. You're a Kshatriya warrior. It's your duty to fight, regardless of the consequences. Don't think about the fruits of your actions. Only do your duty. That's a whole philosophical point of view. Like utilitarianism says, be concerned with the effects. That's what counts. Kant says, no, the only thing that counts is the intention. And that's what Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita. But at any rate, Ralph Waldo Emerson saw Plato and Krishna's Bhagavad Gita as kind of the foundations of wisdom. And uh-huh. Uh, uh-huh. so that, that, to answer that question about Emerson, that's definitely a fact. Right. Yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, he has some tremendous, uh, you know, quotes and, and, and books that I've, I've kind of put off to the side. Uh, and I wanted to ask one more thing about Nietzsche. Well, you know what? Before we, before we leave Emerson and we can go to Nietzsche, who loved Ralph Waldo Emerson, who's his favorite writer. Uh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh, the Oversoul. Okay. So Emerson talked about the Oversoul, which Nietzsche right. got into that and called it the Ubermensch. And, but in the Vedanta philosophy, there's an idea of, um, well, Vishnu's God. There's many forms of Vishnu, but the supreme God of the Christian Trinity would be God the Father. But Vishnu has many forms. Krishna is one. And different branches of Vaishnava or Vishnu-worshipping schools of Vedanta say, oh, Krishna is the original form. Rama is the original form. But whatever the case may be, Vishnu is the supreme soul. And Vishnu has three cosmic manifestations. Maha Vishnu, Karana, also known as Karana Dakasha Vishnu. Vishnu goes to sleep on this causal ocean from the spiritual world, which consists of innumerable spiritual planets, each of which is inhabited by Vishnu and his female counterpart, Lakshmi, and the entire ecosystem is made of spiritual energy. That's reality. Those planets shine the light of Brahman. There's an ocean called the causal ocean, or the Karana ocean, Karana Dakasha Vishnu. He lays down and goes to sleep in this causal ocean, and he exhales from the pores of his skin all the individual bubble universes of the multiverse. And in every bubble universe, there's another Vishnu form called Garbo Dakasha Vishnu. That's where the lotus flower pops out of his navel. The demigod Brahma is born on the blossom at the top of the horizon of the cosmos. And then the planets are created in the stem of that lotus flower. And then in every atom, in every bubble universe, there's another Vishnu form called Kshiro Dakasha Vishnu or Param Atma, topmost soul, an individual atomic soul that's omnipresent and is in the center of your soul and my soul. That's the oversoul. Blaise Pascal, 17th century mathematician and Catholic theologian said, do you think it's impossible for God to be omnipresent and indivisible? Yes. Very well, I will show you something. A point traveling everywhere infinitely fast. For it will be at all points simultaneously and yet remain an indivisible point. Therefore, from something which you previously thought to be impossible, you should learn that there's an infinite amount for you to learn. But this idea of a point traveling everywhere infinitely fast, that's equivalent to a gravitational singularity. And according to the laws of physics, every singularity contains the information from the past, the present, and the future of every universe in the multiverse. And if you and here's the final point, according to the mathematician and theologian Leibniz, Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, 17th century German, wasn't called Germany back then, he had a principle called the identity of indiscernibles. He helped, he co-discovered calculus at the same time as Isaac Newton, independently. The principle of the identity of indiscernibles says if you can't discern a difference between two things, then they are identical. And then there was this philosophy professor, Robert Bruce Ware, who I read, and he was, con- he was applying that to the gravitational singularity. One gravitational singularity from another can't be distinguished by their shape because they're a mathematical point. They have no extension in space, so that's identically the same. Furthermore, because a point of infinite gravity is equivalent to a point traveling infinitely fast and anything that travels faster than light disappears from space and time, you can't differentiate them by their different locations in space and time. They have effects in different locations of space and time, but they themselves are outside of space and time, so they can't be differentiated by their shape and they can't be differentiated by their locations in space and time. Therefore, they are indiscernible, and therefore, they are identical. 
So, the one and the many. You're a soul, I'm a soul. It's what I believe. This is what Plato and Vedanta said. And that at the same time, you and I are both parts of one omnipresent soul. And a way to understand that omnipresence is just a soul traveling everywhere infinitely fast. It would not only be at each point simultaneously, it would be at each point and accumulating at each point an infinite amount at each point at an infinite rate. So God is that one soul who sees through everybody else's perspective simultaneously, whereas you can only see through your perspective and I can only see through mine. But there is a soul who sees through your soul and my soul and every other soul simultaneously. That's God or the Paramatma. And in the hero's journey, the goal is to perform your heroics for that witness because that will be infinitely meaningful because it's the same as being observed by everybody simultaneously. So your nature is to want to be a eternal immortal hero, says Plato in the symposium, says Joseph Campbell in his books, says Ernest Becker in The Denial of Death. It's psychological, the greatest psychological desire is to be an immortal hero in the eyes of God. And studying these physics and these philosophers makes that very plausible. And if you don't believe it's plausible, you'll never be able to apply the effort over a lifetime to achieve that kind of heroics. So if early on in life you were studying these things and you're convinced by reading the evidence, this is real, this is something true that I should strive for, without that kind of conviction, you'll never even start. It's And it's a difficult path. Right. I mean, it's a path that... I, Sounds incredibly daunting, I think, to people, especially that don't have a mission in life, that aren't aware of what it is exactly that they will do, so they don't know what to commit themselves to. And I definitely feel blessed to have known at least a direction when I was pretty young um, on where to head and still learning, obviously, but uh, that helped a ton. And because you, you mentioned this, this desire for us to be our hero and to be a hero in the eyes of God, my, it turned out that my one question on Nietzsche, who I am not very familiar with at all, was about this concept that I found, uh, the will to power, uh, you know, and just this, this thing that drives you, uh, underlies human behavior, you know, and all that. And so I was just going to ask what that was. And I think you kind of, in a sense, have, have, have answered it, but maybe you have some, something else to add from what he what he believed. Yeah, well, I've got a very unique interpretation of Nietzsche. Nietzsche, Nietzsche, Nietzsche. Okay. I've asked German speakers right. and I've got every pronunciation. <laughs> I would so like true. to hear so the true. man with the bushy mustache say his own name <laughs> because he's important to me. I believe he was playing a game with his books, that his okay. surface reading of his books, the God is dead, the atheism was a mask. Nietzsche was raised the son of a Lutheran pastor who died when he was four years old. He was raised by his mother and his aunts, his grandmother, to become a Lutheran pastor. The other children knew, knew him as little pastor because he could read from scripture with sincerity. And he was just an intellectual always in his whole life. He had, he had a mystical experience at age 17 at his confirmation uh, sacrament. But then he became an atheist at age 20. And I argue five years later, he returned gradually to a belief in God when he discovered Arthur Schopenhauer, who's an atheistic philosopher, but was interested in the Vedanta philosophy of India. And he was interpreting Immanuel Kant through this Vedanta philosophy of India based on Shankara, who I mentioned earlier, the impersonalist. But at the same time, there was a very popular theory relating Krishna to Buddha and Christ. That was on the popular level. It was wildly popular. Um, Madame Blavatsky with the Th School of Theosophy. Um, it was based on this Frenchman, Jacolio, a judge who had lived in India for a couple of years. And he claimed to have discovered that, that Krishna is the original template upon whom Buddha and Christ's disciples patterned their, their heroes. And at any rate, it was a, the philologists of Germany got in on the on the scene and they were analyzing it because they were translating these scriptures. So my interpretation of Nietzsche is that he played in what the Western world the role that the Vishnu worshippers say Buddha played in India. According to Hindus, most people don't know this, Buddha, who said basically that there's no God, that there's no individual soul, 
And that if we let go of the illusion of our individual permanent self, then our desires will dry up and we can escape the cycle of reincarnation. It's not a soul that's reincarnating, it's a bad habit that's painful. So stop the bad habit and you will stop suffering. That's nirvana from a Buddhist perspective. But the Hindus say Buddha was Vishnu disguised as an atheist to give the people of the time who were inclined towards atheism at least a basic philosophy that they could believe in to help them at least advance a little bit and stop being malicious to the animals, for example. Nietzsche said, I could be the Buddha of Europe. He also constantly said, I'm lying. I'm wearing a mask. Why do you believe me? The best way to serve a cause is by attacking it. This is what I have done. When he said God is dead for the first time in the gay science section 108, in section 106, he wrote about uh, fighting for a cause by fighting against it. That's what this, a disciple said to his master. The master said, with my ideas, it is like it is with this tree. It has to suffer through all kinds of diseases and storms before it will be, you know, strong and endurable. And then the disciple said, I believe in your cause so much that I'll say everything I have in my mind against it. And then the, the master wagged a finger at him and he said, this is the best form of discipleship, but also the most dangerous. Two sections later, God is dead. Then he said, in India, Buddha was dead, but his shadow was still shown in the centuries in a cave. So he links the idea of God is dead to Buddha. And he knew in the philosophy of, because he was a philologist, he, and he was reading these Sanskrit philologists, his best friend or close friend, Paul Dusain, was one of the greats. So he knew this whole history. So if you read Nietzsche in the context of Indian history and the Vaishnava interpretation of Buddha as a form of Vishnu disguised as an atheist, it turns Nietzsche upside down. But to bring it back to the point of the will to power, he based that on Arthur Schopenhauer's concept of the will. The will is equivalent to Brahman from the Hindu concept, the underlying ground of being. Before you perceive things through the lenses of cognition, so Schopenhauer, I mentioned, combined Immanuel Kant with the Vedanta philosophy, and very briefly, Immanuel Kant responded to David Hume. David Hume says, if I can't see it, smell it, touch it, taste it, or hear it, it's a figment of my imagination. If it's not empirically observable through my five bodily sense organs, then it's a figment of the imagination. And David Hume said also, I don't see, smell, touch, taste, or hear space or time or the idea of cause and effect. I see event A and I always see it followed by event B, but I don't see anything called cause. I just see events and sequences that are occurring. You're in interpreting too much when you say A causes B because you can't observe causality and you can't observe space and you can't observe time. Kant said, you woke me from my dogmatic slumber, David Hume, but space, time, and causality are not fictions humans create. Rather, they are inborn a priori categories of thought, lenses of cognition with which we are born, like absolute ideas imprinted on the soul. And then Kant said, underlying that world of phenomena, which is the physical things you can see through these lenses of cognition, what the thing is in itself, you'll never know, because all you'll know is how it is filtered through your lenses of cognition, space, time, and causality. What the thing in itself is called noumena, the, un, the numinous, and Schopenhauer interpreted that as Brahman. The thing in itself, you see a lamp, a computer, because it's filtered through these lenses of cognition, it's organized for human consumption. The thing in itself is the will. It is Brahman. It's the ground of being. It's like the ocean of waves of probability. It's infinitely energetic and it contains the potential for everything to occur. It's the underlying will of the universe. Nietzsche called it the will to power. And every human being, being a part of nature, is driven by this underlying cosmic will to overcome itself. So it wasn't the will to just dominate like a brute caveman, although that will can manifest that way. And Nietzsche said the will to power has been experienced most profoundly on earth by the Brahmins of India who practiced celibacy and they overcame their own bodily desires to purify this underlying will that they were, they wanted to have power of merging with the universe. That's a true will to power. They weren't concerned with manipulating people on planet Earth. They were concerned with experiencing the surge of the universal will. And he embodied it in the God Dionysus, whom he said we should dance and sing for the God Dionysus. 
And that's how you can manifest the will because the will personified wants to experience itself through humanity. In Nietzsche's first book, The Birth of Tragedy, it's theistic. He's not an atheist in his first book. This is another important point because he was atheistic at age 20. At age 27, when he published his first book, it's theistic. And then in his middle books, he becomes atheistic again. So I'm saying in his books, he's bringing us through the same cycle he went. Belief in God through atheism, and the point is to bring us back to belief in God. But the underlying will is the same as Brahman. It's the, the will of God. Yeah. Uh, I, I, we've already gone over where we said we, <laughs> we, we would. Right. Because and I knew we I knew we would these concepts deserve uh, plenty of uh, <laughs> of time for the for the people though that want to do more you've mentioned your book already you've mentioned another so uh, we'll link to everything obviously is there any place else that you want to send people to check out your work or anything that you're up to Yeah well the the website psycheandsingularity.com so my friend Beto Paredes. He saw my YouTube videos about Psyche and Singularity, my book, and he's like, wow. And he's a, he's a great entrepreneur. He, he creates computer programs for medical technology. At any rate, he had his team set up this website, PsycheAndSingularity.com. You can find a link to my book there, to the class that I'm selling, Immortality and the Unreality of Death, A Hero's Journey Through Philosophy, Psychology, and Physics. My YouTube channel link is there to all my YouTube videos which are on my book, but also I teach at the, at the College of Southern Maryland. So my classes for that class are up there, you know, just point by point, walking people through all these philosophers that we've been talking about. And my academia.edu website, where my papers are published for people to read. So Psyche, with a P, P-S-Y-C-H-E, and singularity.com, but you'll have the link there. Yeah, okay. Well, we will link to everything this is... An incredible conversation, one that's going to stretch the minds of a lot of people. So definitely listen to it a bunch. And, uh, you know, I second that on the books. So guys, if you're not reading, uh, take it slow. If you're not a reader at all, since this is a heavy concept, but you definitely got to you got to create that habit, I would say, uh, rather than the scrolling. Scroll sometimes, but just, right. you know, sit down and study sometimes. <laughs> Yeah, study study. Sometimes it will be useful, and as we said, the theme of this is that, you know, studying this will the ripple effect that it will have on the greater areas of your life is 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 incredible, right? You know, and and, it, and it's quite infinite. So, thanks a lot for coming by. We'll definitely have to do it again. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me. <laughs>